Hey. So I'm Brad Johnson. I'm Associate Director of the Institute on Aging here at Penn. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce today our first virtual visiting scholar speaker, um, Zen Yan, who is coming to us from the University of Virginia, um, where he's a professor in the departments of medicine, pharmacology, and molecular physiology and biological physics. He's also the uh, director of the Center for Skeletal Muscle Research and the Robert M. Bruce Cardiovascular Research Center. And he's also currently a distinguished visiting professor at Tianjin University of Sport in Tianjin, China. And Zhen uh, started with medical training in China and then came to the US um, where he was at the University of Illinois at Champaign and at the University of Texas for master's and PhD degrees and then did postdoctoral work with Sandy Williams at UT Southwestern. And his work uh, has, has really always focused on understanding the mechanisms that underlie the benefits of aging and the, uh, sorry, of exercise in the context of aging. And, uh, you know, there's clearly no magic bullet for the diseases that can affect people it's as they get older. Sure but at least at the moment. Exercise. Sorry? Not, can you guys um, hear me? Don't speak, please. <laughs> Um, we don't have a magic bullet for uh, treating the diseases of aging, but exercise is the thing that comes closest, at least so far, and Zen's figuring out how it works. He's uh, highly productive. He has well over 100 publications. Uh, he's extremely well-funded at the moment. Um, he's got he's the PI of three R1s and a UL1, quite enviable. And I actually met uh, Zen uh, years ago, um, where we overlapped uh, for several years on the uh, CMAD, Cellular Mechanisms of Aging and Development study section. And Zen really stood out uh, to me as someone who uh, could operate in that pretty challenging environment where you know you're, you have to communicate ideas quickly and uh, discuss things with people who bring up ideas that you may not have thought of ahead of time. And, and Zen was always someone who was very thoughtful and insightful and uh, communicated his ideas extremely well. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to his talk today. Thanks, Zen, very much for, for coming. And his talk is Mito AMPK in the Control of Exercise-Induced Mitophagy, Cash for Clunkers. Zen. Thank you, Brad, for the very kind introduction. Um, this is my evaluation for my, men, uh, for my former boss. And, uh, Brad served as the uh, study section chair, and I, I worked under his um, leadership. Um, I'd like to thank John for the envi uh, invitation, uh, invitation, and thank Abney and Mary for arranging this uh, meeting. It's extremely um, honorable for me to be the visiting scholar um, for your institute. And uh, so today, uh, let me sh start to share the screen. Today, Can you tell us what cash for clunkers means at one point, or yes, I will talk it? about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I need to be muted, though. I'm sorry. Oh, I was muted. So I am. What are we? So can you see? Yes. Yep, that looks good. By the way, I should have mentioned. Uh, maybe put your questions into the chat. And I'll monitor that, and uh, we'll read them at the end. Thanks. So I have a special connection to um, UPenn. Um, in 2006, I moved to Singapore, and I. Personally, uh, his name is Britain Ch Britain Chance. So we we had a great friendship, and uh, as you can see here at the bottom of this is a picture I took in 2007. Uh, we had a Christmas party at our um, apartment uh, at the pool here. He came to um, join our Christmas party and you can see the Singapore is kind of hot and uh, we wear shorts and, <laughs> and uh, um, so we had a great time and uh, Britain inspired me a lot um, in terms of research and he came to literally every talk I gave over in Singapore. And every time he was sit in the back of the row and uh, took a nap. And then after my talk, he would ask the toughest question ever. So that's an anecdotal story that I can tell. Um, uh, I really enjoyed interacting with him. 
And uh, his contribution to the field of exercise is a phenomenal. That's the understanding of how we keep up the ATP level in the muscle, even under the strenuous exercise. We don't see change in ATP. We see great um, increase in uh, inorganic phosphate creatine, but a, a dramatic drop in phosphocreatine. And that is his contribution, uh, which really changed the whole view of energy metabolism. So talking about exercise, as uh, Brett said, that exercise is the best. If anything, I would argue exercise is better than medicine. Uh, because exercise is better than any single medicine in treating diseases, uh, slow down the aging process, uh, promoting a healthy aging. Um, I would say we t know too well. A lot of people say, I know exercise is good. I would agree that we know exercise is good. So 4,600 years ago, the first ruler of China, Bondi, mentioned uh, medicine among his scholars, and they discussed it, and they recorded the discussion. And but um, only written down like 2,000 years later, um, 2,600 years later, in the first medical book in China. And what he said is a superior doctor prevents the disease. Mediocre doctors treat the, the disease before evidence, and inferior doctors treat the full-blown disease. So I would say many of the doctors we now have probably at the at the best would be the mediocre doctors or inferior doctors. And we need to promote a prevention and the exercise is uh, probably the best intervention. As you can see on the right side, this is an ancient medical book in China. They even describe the symptom of diabetes and indicating this type of exercise will be beneficial. So I would argue that we all know very well that exercise is superior. However, I would also argue that we know so little. We only know the tip of the iceberg, how good exercise is and why exercise is good. What kind of disease we can prevent and slow down with a, you know, regular exercise. And um, this is a meta study done in 2010 showing that exercise capacity is the best predictor uh, of a survival or negative predictor for um, uh, uh, mortality. And there is a lot of uh, underlying mechanisms that we don't know yet. Um, as um, kind of a member of a track team in the high school, I was so fascinated by how exercise training can improve performance. I want to be the super, you know, like every boy, every, every kid, want to be a super athlete. But later, after my medical school training, I started to realize that Exercise is not only good for improving performance, but also prevent and treat diseases. Um, my lab used many different models to study exercise. And here is one model on the left. It's called a voluntary wheel running. So you can put a mouse in a cage with a running wheel like a hamster. They're going to exercise every night. And some kids will get annoyed because of the squeak, squeaky noise. And so this is an excellent model with, without a human intervention that allow mouse to exercise. We can use the genetic model combined with the exercise to study different things. And these are the images from my lab that we have performed over the years. But recently I developed weightlifting model and a pattern it. And this mouse, you can see that he tried to get the food and uh, in the cage on the very top. And but there's a lever here. They have to lift the weight. And uh, according to this model, we can put the mouse in the cage. We don't have to worry about it. They will count how many times they push. And we can calibrate the lever, put the weight on. Um, they can push about a, against 240% of body weight 200 times per night with a very profound metabolic benefit. So over the years, we studied the impact of exercise on skeletal muscle, joint, uh, heart. Do you metabolism. know if they like the exercise? Do they seem to do it um, on their own, even without the food, to enjoy the exercise? Not for the weightlifting. For the weightlifting, you have to use their kind of a biological um, 
instinct that they have to go after food. For the voluntary will running, you don't need to. Somehow, they may produce some kind of endorphin, make them feel good, and they, they just run on the wheel. Actually, there is a nature paper showing that if you put the running wheel in the wilderness, mice will jump on the it and they run on the wheel. So, so this is a, a fascinating thing of biology, that something in their circuit in the brain, they uh, turn to, um, tend to exercise uh, in terms of running wheel. But for the weightlifting, you have to use food as an incentive for them to push. So that boils down to the question is, as a scientist, what question should I ask? I followed a very fundamental question to begin with. Um, we know that a skeletal muscle in uh, mammals have different types, um, ranging from type 1 to type 2A, type 2D, 2X in humans. But in rodents, there is another one that's called a type 2B. But I arranged these fiber types in the way that it shows that they are more oxidative for the type 1, more mitochondria, more sensitive to insulin, they have more capillaries around each fibers. But on the right, far right, the type 2B fibers are very poor in mitochondria. They are white in color. They have a little um, my, uh, myoglobin. They are insulin, relatively insulin resistant. They have fewer mitochondria. So these are the two muscles. One is solus. One is called a white vastus lateralis muscle. You can see there's a dramatic difference between these uh, muscles. If you cut sections and stain them, you'll see that, you know, they are beautiful. They are chimeric. It's like, you know, you have red fibers here in the, in the center of this muscle. There are blue ones and there are green fibers or the type, two fi type 2B fibers. And each fiber, if you stain with a CD31 for endothelial cells, you can see each muscle fiber is surrounded by capillaries. And within the muscle uh, fibers, you see hundreds, millions of mitochondria. So these are more like an engine. Think about it, muscle is like an engine. You have mitochondria as like a pistons and a, a cylinders producing energy. And you have mechanical component like this muscle fiber, myosin heavy chain, different isoforms connecting the different component of the muscle fiber. And then you have the fuel line, like a capillary, supplying nutrient to the engine. So this biological engine is different from the car. The, you know, we always say that when you buy a brand new car, as you walk out of the um, car dealer, uh, you lose money. And uh, the time goes, the, the engine will lose power. But biological engine is different. Uh, our, our muscle can adapt and increase its capacity in response to training. So I use this cartoon that I wrote for a review article talking about a mechanical component, which is the myofibrils. They overlapped with a cross bridge. And there are mitochondria nearby pro providing energy for the contraction. But the bottom, you see the capillary, uh, the red blood cell will carry oxygen and the blood will carry nutrients to help the engine. And this engine is different. The engine can increase the power. You can change the engine from four cylinder to six cylinder to eight cylinders. And exercise training is one of the best way to improve the engine. And there are signal me mechanisms involved. So I would say that um, Dr. Doug Wallace or Dr. Um, Dan Kelly, and they would agree with me. The center of the universe or biological universe is mitochondria. And mitochondria is the organelle where ATP is generated for biological processes, but using the reducing equivalency from the metabolism. And due to this process, uh, we generate ATP for biological processes. But at the same time, there are some byproduct could be uh, damaging, and like a reactive oxygen species, small molecules. But if the mitochondrial quality is good, we can deal with those reactive oxygen species 
with antioxidant defense. But if the production is too much or we have poor mitochondria, and then we'll have problems. The question is how do we deal with that and why exercise is so good? So when I moved to Duke in 2006, I started with this voluntary wheel running model. As you can see from the panel on the left, on the top, you can see the running activity of four miles at night on the first day of volunteer wheel running. They run about seven kilometers, very, very predictable. And then during the day, they don't run much. After four weeks of running, they run a lot. Some, of, some even run 30 miles per day. And the very, very long ones, yeah. And during the day, they completely stop running. After this four weeks of running, as you can see, here's a cross section of a muscle in our hind limb, in the back of your leg, and it's the plantaris muscle. You can see the blue fibers increase dramatically. This is the type 2A fibers that are oxidative, more, more powerful in generating you know, um, aerobic capacity more capillaries around them. So at the time, I was so interested in knowing what is the underlying mechanism. Almost the same time, uh, Zoltan and, and Bruce Spiegelman worked together, published papers, and showing the importance of PTC1 in exercise-induced adaptation. Uh, so I collaborated with the Bruce, uh, Bruce and um, look at the PTC1 expression as you can see here in the control, exercise, control, exercise, control, exercise, PGC1 protein increased, and uh, myosin heavy chain 2A very profoundly increased, and no change in myosin heavy chain 1. So there is fiber type switching from the very glycolytic fiber to relatively oxidative fiber. And uh, we did the microarray with uh, Caltech, um, um, Al Gilman, uh, we worked very hard on this, and we found very beautiful transient induction of PGC1 mRNA and the VEGF mRNA, indicating that even a single bout of voluntary wheel running, you can induce PGC1 VEGF for metabolic adaptation, uh, capillary density, or angiogenesis. So I took an, a very unique approach, in vivo imaging using the reporter genes. We hook up a PGC1 promoter driving luciferase using the viral RSV promoter as control. And we inject into both legs of the mouse and use the electrical stimulation to mimic exercise. So you can force the muscle contractor for an hour and then measure the luciferase uh, expression in these scattered muscles using imaging. And it's, it's very interesting that PGC1 promoter containing two MEF2 binding sites and a cyclic AMP response element are completely um, required for the PGC1 promoter activity in response to um, nerve stimulation. So this data gave me the confidence that upstream signaling pathway going through cyclic AMP binding site and the MEF2 binding site control PTC1 expression, maybe mediating angiogenesis, mitochondrial biogenesis, and metabolic adaptations. So uh, one of the upstream kinase is important for both MEF2 and ATF2, which is the one bind to cyclic AMP response element, is a P38. I personally had some interaction with Michael Karen. Uh, over the years. So I thought it was a perfect project because PGC1 at the, t at the time is a hot topic and uh, Michael Karen's uh, MEP kinase uh, AMPK is uh, such an, uh, P38 is such an important one. So I um, called Bruce and he gave me the PGC1 knockout mice. We did the muscle specific knockout to remove PGC1 asking the question, is PGC1 really the master gene for everything induced by exercise training? So the answer is PGC1 muscle-specific knockout is really deficit in exercise-induced upregulation of cytochrome oxidase, 
cytochrome C, but not for myoglobin. So it indicates mitochondrial protein upregulation induced by exercise is completely dependent on PGC1. And then if you measure fiber type, as you can see in the wild type, fewer blue fibers, type 2A fibers, increased. And in the PGC1 knockout, fewer ones to begin with still increased. So this is the first time we kind of separate the contractile adaptation from the metabol metabolic adaptation. If you measure capillary density, the wild type increased after exercise training in the knockouts, not increased. So, so it seems to us that, you know, capillary density, angiogenesis, mitochondrial biogenesis is dependent on PGC1, but not the fiber type switching. And this angiogenesis data is really consistent with the Zoltan's data that PGC1 and uh, um, estrogen-related re receptor are important for angiogenesis. As I said, um, we thought P30A MAP kinase is upstream. P30A MAP kinase has three different isoforms, alpha, beta, and the gamma. We asked the question is, which one is important? So we used the approach to take each one of them out and ask the question. And then we figured that it is P38 uh, gamma subunit that is important for mitochondrial biogenesis and, and then downstream effectors. We found VEGF is reduced in the knockout animal in the alpha-1 knockout, and uh, PGC1 mRNA is reduced, not PGC1 beta, not NERF, um, DSCR1, which is a contractile protein um, regulator, it did not show any impairment. So this data suggests that really uh, the MAP kinase P38 gamma is important for uh, PGC1, VEGF, but not important for um, uh, uh, DSCR1 or RCAN. Um, we did the microarray, we found triplicate PGC1 is affected only in the P38 gamma uh, knockout animals. And the other genes, including um, PI3 kinase, KMKK, myogenin, troponin, and uh, BDH1, which is a ketone body um, enzyme. So the next question There's is, many genes that are up and down regulated in your last slide. Are those, uh, the, the ones you read off, those are the uh, dominant ones that change? Um, were, are there others that um, change that you didn't know or you don't know the function of? Well, there are many, many of those change, but uh, those ch we were uh, focusing on the one that were changed in the wild type animal, but um, not changed in the P38 gamma knockout animal. And okay. so these are the downstream. So this confirmed that PGC1 is one of the downstream effector of P38 gamma. Okay. So then we did the uh, P38 muscle-specific knockout of the alpha, beta, and the gamma, and we found the fiber type switching in um, every one of them, um, no uh, impairment at all. Uh, but look at the capillary density. You see the sedentary mice, exercise trained mice, the only one that is impaired in the, is in the P38 gamma knockout. So again, P38 gamma seems to control PGC1 and the VEGF and um, for angiogenesis. Um, the mitochondrial protein only impaired in the P30 gamma knockout animal. So there are a lot of papers published over the years. Um, we uh, ascertain the role of P30 gamma and downstream effector of MEF2, ATF2 in control, PGC1 uh, transcriptional control. But most important, we found PGC1 controls angiogenesis, mitochondrial biogenesis, but not fiber type switching. Which, so there are uh, no trophic factors were, that were upregulated in your paradigm? But yeah, you, what do you mean trophic, uh, trophic factors? Well, like NGF. I mean, maybe some of these are, would be considered trophic factors, but. That's right. N VEGF, NGF. Yeah, VEGF is. Oh, you're VEGF. right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Okay. Very good. So that was the story about the mitochondrial biogenesis. And mitochondrial biogenesis is controlled by 
PDC1 coordination between nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome, adding new mitochondria to the uh, network. However, our mitochondrial network is not a static. And um, due to aging, due to you know, exposure to toxins, and uh, due to inflammation and inactivity, we have problems with the mitochondria. How to deal with the problematic mitochondria is so another very important question. So when I was at Duke, we started to see signs of mitophagy. At the time, the, the term of mitophagy was too new to me. And so, but anyway, over the years, we learned mitochondrial autophagy is controlled by a coordinated event to remove, recognize damaged mitochondria, remove through this process of mitophagy with many factors, including factors to take mitochondria away from the network, called a mitofission, and uh, AKT, um, uh, uh, AKG6, uh, ULK1, and some other adapter proteins like a parking and, um, you know, found C1 and the next uh, BNP3 to kind of recognize damaged mitochondria and remove them. So that's why my title came, you know, with my recent work focusing on mitophagy. Um, I would argue that this is more like a cash flow clunker analogy. And we have clunkers running on the street, polluting the uh, environment. So this policy launched during Obama administration, giving you some money to get rid of your clunker and then you use the coupon to buy new cars is the idea to get rid of the clunkers and clean up the environment, but to keep the economy going. So the, the idea came from this. We noticed that over the time, if we feed mice with a high fat diet, we saw increased accumulation of damaged mitochondria. And if you go exercise, you'll see structure like this with the mitochondria in the center of this uh, uh, vesicle with a double membrane. Some of them even with the dissolved remnant crystal structure. So we believe this is mitophagy, but how do we measure it, visualize it with the millions of mitochondria in skeletal muscle? That's a challenge. So at the time, I interacted with a, a friend of mine from Singapore who took care of Britain Chance. And he's a very good friend of mine who did a postdoc with uh, Tom Sudorf. He came to my office in, at UVA. He said, do you know there is a reporter called a timer? I said, wow, um, why don't I tag that to mitochondrial targeting sequence and uh, get into mitochondria? So my postdoc, Rihanna Laker, took that challenge and the fused mitochondrial targeting sequence with a timer and express it. And now this construct is available at AdGene for $60 or something. And, um, and now we have 500 labs using it. If you transfect this plasmid into adult skeletal muscle, you see this beautiful structure of a single myofiber with um, butter, but, you know, butter, uh, butterflies type of two mitochondria on each side of the Z line. And they align very well. You can see the striation here. And this fluorescent molecule start to fluoresce like a GFP, but when it's oxidized, it will change color to DS red. But in this case, if you transfect the muscle, you'll see some pure red puncta, red, red dots. So we thought it must be mitophagy because um, if you have GFP protein, if that lysosome fused with the autophagosome, it will change the pH and it will kill GFP signal. Therefore, you only see the DS red. And then with that in our mind, we co stand with the COX mitochondrial protein, confirm they are mitochondrial proteins, and then we confirm they are positive for LAMP1, which is a hallmark of a lysosome. So using this construct, we can measure millions of mitochondria at a glance, and we have a com computer system we can uh, uh, analyze the shape, the size, the quantity, uh, the connectivity, and the oxidative uh, stress of mitochondria, 
but mitophagy as well. So with this reporter, we put mice, transfect their muscle with a mitotimer, and feed them with a high-fat diet. Ten weeks later, and we measure in the mice with a normal child fat and high-fat diet fat mice. As you can see here, there is very dramatic change in the mitochondria network. And now this is a lower magnification. You see millions of billions of mitochondria here. And a lot of red dots accumulate in the high fat diet fat animal. So this data suggests that a high fat diet caused mitochondria damage. Somehow mitophagy is increased, maybe not to the point that it can clearly clear. Or maybe there is even an impairment of mitophagy. So this autophagosome with the mitochondria fused with a lysosome cannot be cleared away. So you start to see accumulation. What happened to exercise training in those mice? So we did the analysis with normal child exercise. There was no change in the ratio of the yellow mitochondria. Um, there is a dramatic increase in the overall uh, red, redness of mitochondria network completely restored back to normal due to voluntary wheel running in those mice. If you count the red puncture as an indication of accumulation of mitochondria in the autophagosome fused with a lysosome, you see this a significant increase here, completely prevented or reversed by voluntary wheel running. So this data suggests that exercise can promote mitophagy clear damage mitochondria. So then the next question is how, you know, how many bouts of exercise do you need to do to improve mitochondrial quality and uh, trigger mitophagy? So we use this mitotimer and uh, we subject the mice transfected with the mitotimer to volunteer wheel running and uh, to treadmill run. So this is a treadmill running study. We put mice on the treadmill for 90 minutes, run almost to exhaustion, and then we cut the muscle and look at the mitochondrial network. To our surprise, immediately after exercise, we didn't see a lot of changes. But only after six hours after the bout of exercise, you start to see accumulation of red dots, but then disappear 24 hours later. So this is the change in the red to green ratio this is the accumulation of red dots came back to normal level. On the contralateral leg, we inject this uh, ER timer, which is the same fluorescent protein, but we target it to ER. We didn't see change in color at all. No accumulation of any red dots, no change in color at all. This really validates the mitotimer transfected muscle indeed undergoing or underwent this um, mitophagy oxidative stress. It's confirmed by isolated mitochondria measuring their oxidation of proteins with the 4-HNE showing a transient in increase in oxidative stress in the mitochondrial protein. And we isolated mitochondria measure autophagy marker like LC32, which is a lipidated um, ATG8, and that you can see the accumulation of uh, ATG8 or LC32 in the mitochondrial fraction, indicating there is not only oxidative stress, but, but also mitophagy marker. So putting this together, we had a good idea that even a single bottle of exercise will stress the mitochondria, and the bad mitochondria will be earmarked by oxidation association with autophagy markers for mitophagy. But we did not address the question what other processes are activated to recruit the machinery to um, remove damaged mitochondria. So we addressed this question, but we did not address the question on the left. So at the time, we started to think about what kinase might be important, and we read and searched the literature. We found that NPK, YOLK1, is probably one of the best candidate. So NPK is a very classical kinase. 
with the three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma. And gamma is the subunit that uh, is allosterically bound by AMP or ADP as a trigger for transformation of the structure and expose the alpha subunit to upstream kinases. So this is a two-step activation, binding of AMP or ADP to the binding site, change the conformation, and the kinase work on the alpha subunit and fully activate it by phosphorylation. The residue that is a phosphorylated upstream kinase is a threonine 172. There are at least 12 different combinations of AMPK, alpha-1, alpha-2, and then beta is alpha-1, alpha-2, and the gamma is alpha-1, alpha-2, or, alpha, or gamma-1, or gamma-2, or gamma-3. So in skeletal muscle, we believe um, AMP is the activator of AMPK, rather than, uh, oh, ADP is the um, activator of AMPK rather than AMP. Um, we know exercise training like this, a six minute of running in mice, activated AMPK, you can see this three muscles all have increased the phosphorylation of threonine 172. And if you measure AMP, dramatically increased, but never above the KM of AMPK. ADP dramatically increased, but it's twice as much, maybe more, than the KM of AMPK. It's associated with the increase in the AMPK activity. So this data from um, you know many labs, including Bruce Camp uh, in Australia, and uh, Graham Hardy and Dundee, they all suggest that AMPK is an important uh, kinase for exercise. Rubin Schaus group in uh, San Diego showing that AMPK and the UOK1, and UOK1 is downstream of AMPK, are required for mitophagy. So this is a hepatocytes. He used the TOM20 um, to stand for the number of mitochondria in hepatocytes. In the AMPK knockout uh, cell, or your K1 knockout cell, you see the accumulation of mitochondria. And he did the biochemistry showing that your K1 is downstream of AMPK uh, with um, a ACAR as a stimulator, because ACAR is a director agonist of AMPK. So my postdoc, Josh, started to take this approach to study um, AMPK activation in response to exercise. He found AMPK, threonine 172, UOK1, serum 555 are all activated by a single bout of exercise immediately after exercise, but not the other phosphorylation site of the UOK1. And then using muscle specific knockout and the muscle specific dominant negative transgenic approach. Uh, constitutively active approach, we confirmed AMPK is required for exercise-induced activation of uh, your K1 serum 555 and sufficient to activate your K1. So Josh took the mitotimer approach, asked the question, what happened if we use the knockout animal or transgenic animal with, you know, knockout of uh, P38, uh, uh, PG, uh, AMPK, or this um, UOK1. Um, the take home message is that in the UOK1 muscle specific knockout, um, you have blunted the mitophagy um, due to the exercise, as you can see here, with a significant reduced number of accumulation of red puncta using the mitotimer approach. And uh, they are co to the uh, LAMP1 as a marker for mitophagy. So this data suggests a single bout of exercise trigger acute response of mitophagy, but this process is dependent on MPK and UOK1. Most importantly, and you know, we, we care about mitophagy, but I think it, if it doesn't do anything, it, it's not of interest to us. And we are interested in, you know, metabolic adaptation. It is very well known that if you go exercise, 
you improve insulin sensitivity. Exercise training is even more profound in improving uh, insulin sensitivity. So here, the panel on the top on the left is a wild type of control animal. You go exercise train them, you see the significant improvement in the glucose tolerance test. But in the ULK1 knockout animal, you do not have that change. And uh, it's quantified by area on the curve showing no improvement by exercise training in the ULK1 knockout animal. But most importantly, we measured the AKT phosphorylation in response to insulin in the wild type animal before and after training, and then in the knockout animal before and after training. As you can see here at the bottom of the western block, you see this profound increase in AKT phosphorylation, much more profound in the, uh, in the exercise trained wild type animal. But this improvement in the insulin signaling is absent in the muscle specific ULK1 knockout animal, suggesting ULK1, if we agree ULK1 is essential for mitophagy, then mitophagy is important for improved insulin sensitivity induced by exercise training. So we complete the story that we believe AMPK triggered by exercise training and energetic stress triggered by exercise training in skeletal muscle combined uh, to remove damaged mitochondria as a way to improve mitochondrial quality. So as I said in the very beginning, the, the network is dynamic. Exercise training add a new mitochondria, but exercise training also trigger the removal of damaged mitochondria. This cash for clunker approach really helped us to maintain the healthy mitochondrial network. However, can, can yes. In yes. ULK1 knockouts, when you exercise them, do they exercise to the same level of intensity? Absolutely. Okay. They, they exercise to the same, um, you know, intensity, duration. And we even notice very subtle thing changed is that, you know, your K1 mice even can run a little bit longer if, uh, it depends. If it's a knockout animal, they run a little bit less after exercise training. They can not run very, very well compared to the wild type trained mice. But in the knocking mice, we have just recently got and they can even run a little bit better is because they have normal ULK1 there, but they cannot be activated. So somehow they have more mitochondrial accumulation. More mitochondrial means more engine. So for the exercise capacity, they may improve a little bit better, but then the metabolic function is impaired because of the poor mitochondrial quality. Thanks. So, so there's something that, that didn't make sense to me. Uh, imagine muscle fiber is as long as your arm, joint to joint, if your leg is knee to your ankle. That's the size of the, your muscle cell. But the muscle diameter of the muscle fiber is only 50 micron. I use this analogy to tell my students, say, just imagine muscle fiber is like a cell, like the highway from Charlottesville to Washington, D.C. 100 mile, but the width of that is like, a, you know, 50 uh, yard or something like that. So it's a very, very thin, very, very long cell. It doesn't make sense for me to imagine that you have to activate everything in that long highway to just to rescue a small part of something. And plus muscle cell is packed with a contractile proteins with, a, you know, nanometer distance. You don't have the luxury to have organelles like autophagosome or mitochondrial travel, like a lot of people show in the cultured cell, mitochondrial travel along the axons going back and forth. But in, in muscle, in the heart, you don't have that luxury. So the question is, where is this rescue team coming from? Um, where is the alarm signal? Uh, where is the alarm set? So I would use this as an analogy. You know, the Great Wall is long, very, very long. You have towers here. If one tower got attacked, the idea is the soldier from the tower next to it, or maybe another one, you know, the second one from close to it, will come to the rescue. And you have to have a trigger, have a signal 
but then you have to have the traffic for the soldiers to come to the to the tower. But what if the Great Wall is packed like this, and you will never be able to do that, right? So that's that's what happened here uh, in skeletal muscle and in the heart. So our idea is that maybe the MPK UOK1 is right next to the damaged mitochondria, or normally reside there. So when we had that idea, my postdoc Josh started to do engine search to see whether muscle or uh, whether MPK in the mouse and in the humans can target to mitochondria. Uh, this three search engine showed there is a possibility of MPK alpha one target to mitochondria. And this is a mitochondrial protein, of course, it has mitochondrial targeting sequence. Then we, we found that uh, interactome analysis showing a lot of mitochondrial proteins have been shown to be physically interacted with MPK alpha one or alpha two. So there are some anecdotal uh, evidence. Then we did the immunofluorescence in skeletal muscle. We saw this complete overlap of COX-4 signal with MPK alpha one, alpha two. It doesn't mean there are no other MPK pools, but they are clearly overlapped. So the next question is, can we purify mitochondria and measure MPK? So we did the POCO gradient, the GOAT standard, isolated muscle, liver, heart, um, kidney, mitochondria, and the Western block them. And this is just the data from gastrocnemius muscle, but we confirmed in many other tissues that you can see the cytosolic fraction, you have MPK, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, gamma. But in the mitochondrial fraction, we only have alpha one, alpha two, and the beta two, and the gamma one. So this is the band, gamma one, not gamma two, and not gamma three, beta two, not beta one, and alpha one, alpha two. So it appears to me that we have two different isoforms. It's alpha one, beta two, gamma one, or alpha two, beta one, uh, beta two, gamma one, um, the, the uh, association of AMPK. And then if we treat these um, membrane with um, peptide of AMPK, pre-incubated antibody with the peptide, and then we can block this, um, uh, the Western blot uh, image of the alpha one. So this on the right is the antibody pre-incubated with the antigen. So it's called an antigen blocking. If we treat isolated mitochondria, you can see TOM20 disappeared, COX4 remained, but all these alpha one, alpha two, beta two, gamma one disappeared. So this data help us to make the conclusion that this MPK is associated with the outer membrane of mitochondria. Then we did the human skeletal muscle and the human left ventricle, showing the, the presence of these isoforms of MPK subunit in the mitochondrial fraction. And then we collaborated with a uh, Graham Hardy, the grandfather of MPK, asked him to help us to measure MPK in the mitochondrial fraction. So he did the whole cell lysate cytosolic fraction and the mitochondrial fraction and measured the MPK activity. Um, he found MPK activity in these different fractions of um, proteins. Um, and then he did stimulation with the AMP as a ligand and showing this indeed, um, this pool contains MPK activity. So we showed a presence of MPK and the enzymatic activity of MPK associated with the mitochondria. Then we did the four different approach to measure activation of MPK. And we showed that treadmill running ischemia using a tourniquet to, to uh, induce ischemia of the hind limb or Langendorf to have a complete global ischemia to the heart or ligation of the artery to the kidney 
So I use this as an example. Only five minutes of ischemia can activate a mito-MPK. This is a mitochondrial fraction, mito-MPK in the kidney mitochondrial fraction. Very profound activation without a change in total MPK. So we showed evidence of presence, activity, activation. We showed another um, piece of evidence with the treadmill running. So this is a gastrocnemius muscle. We saw increase in the phosphorylation of MPK, but not in the last two samples, the dominant negative MPK transgenic animal. Um, this is the quantification at the bottom. And uh, most excitingly, we did this treatment with a metformin injecting into IP injection of metformin 250 mg per kilo and for three days. And then we took the muscle and the measure cytosolic AMPK and the mitochondrial AMPK. And we did not see activation in the cytosolic fraction. We saw a moderate increase in these free samples of the metformin treated animal, uh, increased the phosphorylation of mitoAMPK. So this is consistent with the idea metformin is a mitochondria electron transport chain complex one inhibitor. And because of the inhibition of mitochondria, it causes energetic stress and preferentially activate a mitoAMPK. That might be the reason metformin is really good for um, type two diabetes, in increasing insulin sensitivity. We used a FRED imaging using outer membrane targeting sequence with um, the donor and acceptor with a, a, a peptide that is um, AMPK substrate. And using this FRED imaging reporter, you can see heterogeneous mito-AMPK activity in a muscle fiber, adult muscle fiber transfector with this reporter before nerves, uh, before stimulation. 20 minutes stimulation trigger, you know, heterogeneous activation of mito-AMPK in the muscle fibers. And the cell culture experiments showing uh, oligomyosin can trigger the activation of mito-AMPK. So this AMPK pool of AMPK physically associated with the mitochondria can sense the energetic stress. And so the question is, what is this energetic stress? We believe it is ADP. We don't know. We don't have the you know, direct evidence for that. Um, but then the question is, what is the function of it? So to start to address this question, we use a approach developed at um, Johns Hopkins and the UCSD using this mitochondrial targeting sequence with a um, M cherry and then um, the peptide for the MPK substrate. It's like an MPK substrate. We overexpress this construct. Remember Rubin Shaw's data I showed in the hepatocytes. When you inhibit MPK or knock out a UOK1, you have accumulation of mitochondria. In the C2C12 cells, when we transfect this plasmid, overexpressing MPK, we saw accumulation of mitochondria. And this is happening in the C2C12 cells, but not in the one without a transfection or transfected with um, empty vector. And it's actually, we have data to show if we mutate the phosphorylation site, you can overexpress this peptide to the same level, but if you mutate the phosphorylation site for MPK, you do not have this accumulation. Finally, we did this in vivo study with a mitotimer showing that if you overexpress this mitochondrial MPK inhibitor called a mitochondrial AIP, um, AMPK inhibitory peptide, we did not block the st oxidative stress signal induced by exercise. So exercise can still induce oxidative stress. Here, even at the baseline, they have some stress, but mitophagy is impaired. So exercise-induced mitophagy seems to be dependent on mitochondrial AMPK. And this is uh, one of the things we are doing right now. We do this CRISPR very effectively. We can do like, you know, um, many lines. We generate MPK alpha 1, alpha 2, constitutively active and, and loss of function, four different lines. We bred them into a black 6 background. 
we also generate a UOK1 knocking mice. So now we have this perfect tool to study MPK in, in, in the setting of knocking rather than knockout because MPK must partner with many, many, many proteins. If you knock them out, you disrupt the uh, stoichiometry. But in this case, we did not disrupt the uh, stoichiometry. We only block the activation. So this is the, the model that we have. Look at this. This is the knocking mice with alpha, alpha 2 MPK alpha subunit with uh, threonine 172 to change to alanine. You see the absence of phosphorylation with a residual phosphorylation from alpha 1. And um, this is the cytosolic fraction, and no, no impact on the MPK expression. Only phosphorylation is blunted. Um, then we did the UOK1, the same thing. We have UOK1 phosphorylation at, at this side is an inhibitory phosphorylation side by mTOR. No impact there, but completely abolished the phosphorylation of serum 555. So now we have these five different lines we can study the impact of exercise in this setting. Although it's global, knocking approach is, the, sh the shortcoming is that it's global, it's not specific to skeletal muscle. But nevertheless, this is one of the uh, you know, best possible approach at this point. So I'd like to end this with a cartoon, kind of uh, reiterate the uh, central hypothesis. We believe neuromuscular junction is where the contractile activity comes in and the, the depolarization deep into the, into the muscle through the T-tubule and the cause rhinitin receptor release of calcium and the trigger um, the formation of a cross-bridge cycle and the contraction. This is a process with consuming ATP and I convert that to ADP and the ADP has to be transferred through the system that Britton Chance described and back to mitochondria and then to be resynthesized to ATP. So the blue dots are ATP, and that will go to the muscle, and the yellow dot will come back. But it, you, can you imagine there is a network part of the mitochondria is uh, not optimal. They are slow in generating ATP. The ADP level will be higher at this location, a microdomain location. We may not be able to measure it unless we have a very good reporter, and this activation of AMP can trigger the downstream event like MFF phosphorylation, recruit DRP1 for removal of this damaged mitochondria from the network, and then coordinate with the activation of UOK1 through phosphorylation and move this out of uh, mitochondria to a separate location and uh, engulfed by autophagosome fused with the lysosome for degradation. Combined with the mitochondrial biogenesis, this is the way to remove damaged mitochondria, adding new mitochondria to improve mitochondrial quality. So as a researcher, I always think about what's the impact we have? You know, of course, we enjoy what we do, and we think about this. You know, I, you know I'm excited. I just like a bread excited about the telomere. I'm excited about mitochondria. I'm excited about this. But what's the big difference we're going to make? I think what we are doing here is tremendously important to help the policymakers and, and also we bear the responsibility to tell the public that how good exercise and lifestyle intervention is um, important for the healthy aging or health span. And I believe the work we are doing is going to make a fundamental difference. And I would argue that people on the street don't know how good exercise could be to help them. That's why they don't practice. And I have a bike in my in the back. I, I say, always say I, pre, I practice, but not just to preach, I'm also practicing. Uh, I have recently got the U01, uh, joined the force with many other, other labs here. Uh, we have this consortium called a, a Motopack to study the molecular transducer of physical activity. And we are using collaborating with six other faculty at UVA. We are focusing on the identification and the elucidation of the rule of, rule of um, molecules mediated in the health benefit of exercise with a loss of function, uh, CRISPR uh, knocking approach, and with a 
inducible tissue specific inducible pulsatile inducible system to mimic the pulsatile activity of exercise to elucidate the factors in uh, mediating the benefit of physical ac activity. So that's what we are doing. We're not only just doing muscle work, but also we are interested in NASH, interested in fat and the brain, mental function, cognitive function. And so um, a lot of exciting things ahead of us. I really like to thank you all for attending this seminar and uh, I'm looking forward to the questions. So in the end, I would say we want ourselves and all the doctors in the future to be superior doctors rather than inferior doctors or mediocre doctors. With that, I would like to thank my lab. Particularly, I'd like to thank Rihanna Laker, very talented postdoc from Australia, and she's working in the industry right now. And Josh Drake is, um, uh, was the postdoc in the lab. He's the assistant professor with a very sizable um, startup money at the, uh, Virginia Tech. Um, so uh, this work was done uh, at the beautiful campus of University of Virginia um, with funding from NIH, FARA, um, American Heart and uh, American Diabetes Association with a lot of collaborators, including you know, Wayne State University, RJ Wells, Monica Driscoll at Rutgers, um, an expert in the C. elegance research and exercise model. Laurie Goodyear at Harvard, who is the PI of this uh, motor pack uh, uh, animal study. Uh, Monica Driscoll, um, uh, the uh, Mondira Kondo, uh, who provides uh, the YOK1 knockout animal, and uh, Gregory Sternberg and uh, Graham Hardy are two experts in um, AMPK field. So with that, I'd like to ask the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. That was a very nice talk. Very interesting. Um, I've got some questions, but they're already popping up in the uh, in the chat. So let me let me read those. Um, Hua Feng Wei um, says, Brad, can we you. ask questions? Is it okay to ask questions? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think if it gets too unruly, you, we'll have okay. to just do it with the chat. But if you want to start with a verbal question, go ahead. I just want to thank you very much. It was a great lecture. I knew Britt Chance for the last 15 years of his life when he was at Penn. He was bugging me all the time to, to collaborate on Alzheimer's disease, and Virginia Lee and I tried very hard to somehow find a pathway for him into the brain, and it just never worked. It was uh, very disappointing that I wasn't a better communicator, and uh, so I just don't want to miss the opportunity again, Shen. If there's uh, Jen, if there's anything that you think you could do with us on brain aging, because the exercise benefits for brain aging are as potent as for muscle, but we just know very little. You know, it seems to be trophic factors uh, in part, but I'm certain there's other things. So the um, opportunities there, if you have ideas that you'd like to pursue jointly with us. Yes, uh, and I really thank you for the invitation. That's uh, quite an honor for me. Um, I, I, I do, I do have, and uh, we are planning to do the J20 mic with the um, AD, AD model, and we have just got the data to show that in the Dengue gyrus, um, after a single bout of exercise, there's an activation of AMPK in the neuronal cells in the Dengue gyrus. I have done a pilot study to show that exercise training, like eight weeks or four weeks of voluntary wheel running, increased neurogenesis in Dengue gyrus. So wow. that's, that's the direction that I definitely, I'm very Good. excited about. Yeah. It's wide open, and you would uh, you would do very well, I'm certain. Go ahead, Brad. So I just had that question I want to ask. Yeah. Um, thanks, John. So Hua Fun Wei is wondering if um, mitophagy and autophagy might ever play a role in disease that is actually made worse by exercise, like heat shock. Uh, made worse by exercise? I think that's the, the, the gist of the question, yeah. Well, you know, let, uh, go, go maybe, ahead. maybe over exercise. You know, did, can, uh, can you can you drive the mitophagy system to the point of of actually causing pathology? Yes, uh, I I think normally we were um, rarely over exercise. I would say rarely over exercise. 
if anything, I would say exercise may cause injury rather than uh, too much of a mitophagy could be uh, detrimental. Usually what happened is that people don't exercise. They think, oh, I haven't exercised for, for too long. Let me go exercise today. And then they, they exercise too much, but not necessarily biologically too much. It's, it's an exercise too much cause injury. They, they, they are not care. They didn't do warm up and things like that. So there is very little evidence that, you know, marathon running may be different and you know, it's too long and sometimes cause, um, uh, you know, um, you know, red blood cells to burst and causing, you know, blood in the, in the urine. And that, that may be not be good. But, uh, you know, normally we don't uh, over exercise. So I, I, I don't, I don't think that you can really cause um, mitophagy induced by exercise be harmful. Um, in, in all, of the course. only thing I can think of is the Bataan Death March or rare examples of, of things that happened during wartime. The Bataan Death March, as you know, where these people marched in the Philippines, uh, complicating the understanding of what happened was the fact that they were not fed very well either. So oh, yeah. there, there really aren't any good humane <laughs> ways to, to test that hypothesis and, and uh, fortunately we don't have baton death marches anymore. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Ken Foskett has, a, has another question. Um, he's wondering if, you know, you talked about um, AMPK and the outer mitochondrial membrane and he's wondering if there's any evidence uh, for phosphorylation of inner mitochondrial membrane proteins by AMPK. For example, the uh, MCU calcium channel, I guess it's been suggested to be such a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question. And I, I, would, I, I personally would love to know the idea. So actually we are trying to do it right now. Uh, we are collaborating with, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Pacific National Laboratory Shadow uh, within phosphoproteomics. And uh, the first thing we, we are going to do, you know, we have the mice here and we're going to drop it. And so basically, a wild type mouse and uh, um, MPK knocking mice and go uh, with or without a treadmill running, we isolate the mitochondria immediately after exercise and then put them in the condition with the phosphatase or protease inhibitors. We're going to measure phosphoproteome of the mitochondria, which include the matrix and um, in the mitochondrial membrane proteins. So hopefully we'll get the answer soon. And then uh, Hung Tao Zhang. Yes, Hung Tao uh, is a friend of mine. Oh, <laughs> he's wondering if you've checked to see if fasting impacts the uh, the system you just talked about. Yeah, actually, I'm thinking about it all the time, and uh, uh, these three interventions are of my great interest because every one of them has uh, anti-agent. So today we we are here uh, institute on the agent, right? So metformin exercise and the caloric restriction are all of my interests. I would believe uh, fasting will, will help to um, cause this um, activation of mito MPK in some mitochondria, some maybe subpopulation of mitochondria help to remove them. Maybe that's you one know of the people who are doing, I know Mark Matson does caloric restriction. I don't know if you know him. He's a scientist working on Alzheimer's disease at the NIH, and he's he he looks like a concentration camp victim. I don't know how otherwise to state it, but he's extremely thin, um, and plans to live to be 200. I guess I don't know, but I, I'm being <laughs> I'm being flip. I mean, I, I he really is putting into practice, you know, what uh, he believes that uh, caloric restriction, not starvation, but caloric restriction will yes. uh, benefit his own personal aging. And do you have, I mean, I know there are caloric restriction clubs uh, where people do this and support each other and so forth, but do you know anyone who studied those people and would have some hard scientific data on how they are aging? Uh, I, what? Oh, I, I guess okay. that was... Yeah, for human studies, I do not... I do not follow human studies. I know in rats. Not a lot, but I. Yes, I Could you, if you're on this call, could you depart? 
So um, I know that red study done by John Holosi, uh, Wash U, and is probably one of the uh, seminal studies showing this, you know, benefit of caloric restriction. So later, uh, they, they still have this debate whether exercise is um, uh, really good for aging. Um, and and I, I, I believe for health span, exercise is definitely really, really good. Maybe caloric restriction has this um, positive impact on lifespan, but in terms of health span, I think exercise may be even better. Um, and then, then in terms of um, the uh, um, aging, uh, you know, itself, um, the 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 chloroquine studies we did in Shanghai about the eight years ago, we show that a lifelong exercise plus chlor moderate, really moderate, twenty percent chloroquine is probably the best in in uh, maintaining healthy. Um, profile of gut microbiome and all the muscle phenotype, everything, you know, metabolic phenotype, glucose tolerance, you know, insulin levels and um, cytokines, it's really profound. So a combination- The exercise reg regimen that they uh, uh, pursued in China, was it something like Tai Chi or weightlifting no, it's, or- it's the animal, animal study, so it's a voluntary- oh, animal, animal. okay. Yeah. Voluntary wheel running with a, a very okay. moderate restriction of the amount of calorie. Yeah, 20%. Okay. I, I, I was an author on that paper. I yeah. got it, yeah. So, Jen, I have a question. Yes. Um, have you looked yet to see whether the AMPK, ULK system of mitophagy is, is changed with age or in terms of just basal level or responsiveness to exercise? Is that clear? Yeah, I have no, um, I did not uh, obtain any data on ULK1 and, and the exercise, but um, my postdoc who got the K award, um, he, that's why he got a, a million do dollar startup package at the Virginia Tech. And he, and he did measure AMPK on mitochondria in aged mice. And he saw 50% drop in the total, you know, per mitochondrial protein. 50% drop in the AMPK association with mitochondria. So there is a possibility that the sensor, the alarm is reduced. So that therefore you cannot activate it as much as a young person. And then another question, the, the cash for clunkers analogy. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to understand uh, exactly how you get a net benefit out of this. I, I, and I, it's not hard to imagine, but I'm just wondering wh wh what you know, because you could you could you could think that at the point where you have to give away your clunker before you bought your new car, yeah, things are a little worse than they were before. Yeah. So is there a short-term short kind of problem that no you get long-term benefit from with the system? Or I, I think it? the cash for clunker in skeletal muscle is actually is that why you are stimulating mitochondria probably by stimulating mitochondria, um, you know, protein expression, you know, you increase the content, the activity of protein, and it got rid of the damaged mitochondria, increase the new mitochondria. I, I don't think you have to reduce mitochondrial capacity to begin with. Maybe, maybe the increase, like a PGC1, protein expression could be triggered by, um, you know, a few bouts of exercise and then the translocation of PGC1 already kick in to stimulate a mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so this could be simultaneous process. Mitophagy, you know, enhanced activity also increase new mitochondria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? That, that's it for what's in the chat. Yeah, maybe if I could just clarify um, the previous question. I, I'm just curious as to all of these responses seem to be a hormetic response, right? You're stressing mitochondria, it's inducing mitophagy. So my question is, if mitochondrial biogenesis couldn't occur, are we saying that all of the impacts of mitophagy would go away because you would only have a deleterious effect? Yeah, good question. That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer, but I, I have the tools uh, to, if that's of interest enough, I have the tools to address that. So I, 
I do have the PTC1 flux to mice here, which presumably is required for mitochondrial biogenesis. So, but, you know, a straightforward prediction would be, yes, it, you know, if you don't have PTC1, you may not have increased mitochondrial biogenesis. If you just have mitophagy, you may reduce the number and the size of mitochondria, which could be uh, detrimental for exercise performance, but not necessary for met metabolism. Because we, we only use 10% of the mitochondria for the metabolism we need for ATP production at the baseline. Yeah, I think it might be of some interest. I know that there's some recent papers showing that uh, metformin intervention in old animals actually has a deleterious effect rather than that's, a positive that's effect. Correct. So yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, I noticed that. Yes. Yes. That's a that's a that's a great point. Thank you. Dr. Yan, I want to ask a question. So you mentioned the whole setup with the voluntary and the psychostatic exercises at the very beginning. How yes. does that have to do with all like the downstream how does that relate to the, all the downstream genetic factors that you mentioned? Uh, so I assume you are asking the question that how could exercise regulate the downstream? So can you paraphrase like, that again? Yeah, I, I guess like what, I mean, they're both exercising the skeletal muscle. Oh, uh, you're talking like, about the two different modes of exercise? Yes. I see. I see. Okay. So endurance running or endurance exercise is a kind of a relatively lower intensity, continuous repeated contractions um, without um, uh, getting to the anaerobic threshold, which means, you know, just mitochondrial respiration is enough to keep the muscle contracting forever, roughly. Okay. You know, in, in that sense, for the weightlifting, you you are 100%, you know, contracting. Even maybe the circulation is could be occluded because of the power of the uh, uh, tension generated by the muscle. For temporarily, you are quickly getting to the anaerobic metabolism, and and uh, the stretch of the membrane is not cyclic. It's it's like you know, very. Uh, strong contraction. So these two modes of exercise are very different. So endurance exercise eventually challenge the mitochondria, but uh, the resistant exercise is like a possibly stress. Some many factors are mechanically sensitive uh, factors. So we have, uh, and, and also stimulate an anabolism, you know, protein synthesis to increase the size of the muscle, but endurance exercise will never promote the growth of uh, muscle, like a satellite cell activation, things like that, yeah. Okay, I understand better, thanks. Thank you. It's 321, we have, we can certainly go on and ask more questions if uh, people have more questions. There's no hard end time for this, so it's uh, up to the uh, people um, on the program here to uh, yeah. bring more issues up to Shen Yan. I think we're... I think we're probably good. That, that's it for the questions in the chat, unless anybody has another question they want to bring up. Why don't we, uh, why don't we stop? And thanks, Zen, very much for uh, a, a wonderful talk and great discussion. And uh, thank you all for, for coming. We'll have uh, more of these visiting uh, speaker talks soon. I'm not sure what the next one is, Kathy. But, uh, I, I believe it's in February, but I'm not 100% sure either. And thank you, Brad, for your introduction to Shen Yan and organizing the questions or, um, from the chat. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you, Zen. Yes, yeah. good. I wish you could take you out to dinner, Zen. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you can well, have the, virtual dinner or virtual the, wine. <laughs> the, good, the good news is you don't have to travel back to your That's university. Right. 
Uh, but if you want to exercise, you can hop on your exercise cycle and back if you want. Yeah, or, we could, or, or go outside before the sun goes down. We've got, still got a few yeah. minutes yeah. left. It's been a marvelous fall here in Philadelphia. I hope you also experienced a wonderful fall where you are. Yes, yeah, yeah. We are not really far apart, not yeah. really different. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you thank for you, the Brad. invitation, and I enjoyed it every minute. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.